This is such a wonderful place to celebrate anything, and uh, I'm very grateful that uh, Aman and uh, Rekha decided to do this at Neem Rana, which is one of the most beautiful spots anywhere in India, and it's a wonderful way to celebrate. I don't know, there's no turning points, there are only a few small milestones and then it all adds up uh, over the years and uh, I think I've just led a very exciting and amazing, uh, amazingly full life uh, for which I have to be really grateful at 60 that I've done so much and I hope that I'll be doing still a lot more. Uh, yeah. Well, you grow as a painter. We've been painting for 45 years, so uh, there are different phases. Uh, I think uh, one of the important phases was the phases where I began to use real windows, uh, play around with junk, uh, got influenced by old photographs. Uh, but the last 10 years, I did a lot of experimentation with other medium besides just painting in oils. I did an exhibition of uh, painted objects. Uh, and this, to me, was very important because it is the very opposite of installation art, which is so popular now. Uh, installation art, to me, is an art that you make an installation and then it's destroyed or wasted. And it's, uh, it came out from the West, which is a uh, civilization of waste. Whereas in India, we are used to conserving things, uh, retrieving things. Uh, and so that exhibition of uh, painted objects was all old things that had been junked, thrown out. Old suitcases, old cupboards, uh, frigidaires, uh, things that had already been thrown away. And it's so much part of our tradition, like in the Kanthas, to save an old sari, put it together, embroider it, uh, and make it into an object of uh, art or beauty. So it was very much in that spirit that that exhibition was done. Then the other ex uh, Ex experiment was uh, the computer morphed uh, paintings that I did about four or five years ago, which I now think were a little ahead of uh, their times uh, because uh, I don't think people are ready for that. And now when it's happening, uh, I realized that I had done it already five years ago. Uh, that, but the infinite possibilities of using the computer as a tool, I don't say as a medium, but certainly as a tool for making images, uh, for combining images. In that, what I did was to morph uh, images from, say, three decades of work. So in one image that was created was perhaps a painting from the 50s, from the 70s, and the 90s. And they all morphed into one uh, single image. And I had great fun doing that. It, it was amazing what you could do with the computer. I mean, you could move the crow from this end and put it mm -hmm. there. You could remove a chair and put it in something else. And uh, with such ease, it takes you so long to do it manually. And in the computer, it's done within seconds. Uh, so I think that's a great possibility. Uh, and last year, I did the uh, exhibition of glass from Murano. And I enjoyed that very much. Uh, sculptured objects uh, which were made in crystal. And spent a lot of time in Italy making those. So it all involves travel, and it involves different medium. So these digressions are, are fun. But I think I usually come back to painting in oils. Mm Well, I think uh, that uh, the transitions also reflect one's own <coughs> progress as a woman. Uh, in fact, in the computer um, uh, exhibition, there was uh, a big, uh, very large work, which is now in the National Gallery, which is called Mutations. And it shows five uh, panels. It's very large. It's about uh, six feet by 17 feet, uh, which shows the woman uh, morphing or changing uh, in her various forms. It's the same woman. Sometimes she's half hidden, sometimes she's with a child. So I think the woman has many avatars uh, and many stages in her life. And um, I feel that I've also mutated many times. 
Well, if there was a struggle, uh, you know, a lot of people think that uh, the struggle of an artist uh, is a physical struggle, a struggle for uh, money or space or whatever it is. But I think the true struggle of the artist is more a mental and emotional one. The struggle, for instance, when you're changing from one uh, phase to another, sometimes uh, the muse deserts you and you just see blankness in front of you. Uh, the struggle to change, the struggle to know when to stop, uh, that, that's a very important stage uh, of an artist's development. Uh, so those, what I call essentially artistic struggles, are the ones that really eat you up, that give you sleepless nights, that um, make you afraid or unhappy. Uh, I, I think that particularly when is one was young, one didn't mind poverty at all. You sort of lived through the, till the end of the month. You ate dal for the last three days. You know, uh, it didn't matter uh, that one was struggling materially. But uh, those artist struggles were always there. Yes. Well, at times one was irritated with it, what always having to move. But I think that the stimulus that it provided, because it was nomadic in the sense that we were in all kinds of countries, uh, having to manage, having to learn a new language, I think it all adds, uh, it's all grist for the mill. And uh, it may not uh, manifest itself in your work straight away or while you're there. But somewhere, I think any experience, and I think traveling and moving is a big experience. Uh, does have an effect on your work. It certainly uh, is, I think movement is the enemy of stasis. And I don't think that uh, if you're static, uh, you can uh, be creative. I think the two things are uh, complementary that you have to move uh, to be creative. Not necessarily. I mean, for instance, we were in Germany for three years, and I don't find any influence of Germany in my work except for a few very lonely landscapes. Uh, but I think that India continues to be the prime stimulus, uh, and this is why I, I think I, I was offered a very, very good uh, deal by New York galleries in the 80s, early 80s, and I rejected those because uh, I, I think that this is the only country uh, where I can live, where there's enough stimulus, uh, and it, it's the last, it, it's the last country in the world where things are still different, things are still interesting. Uh, the whole of the rest of the world seems to have become McDonaldized, um, and everything is becoming the same. I was recently in China, and I was hoping that the first time I'd go to China, I'd see things are so Chinese, and it's amazing. Everybody was in Western clothes. There's McDonald's everywhere. There was a kind of flattening of culture, which is almost worldwide. And this is the last country left where there is still Kumbh Mela and there's so many exciting things happening. Yes. Well, I have many influences, different influences, different times uh, of one's career. One can't continue for 45 years with the same influence. So there's been a range of influences. A very strong influence was film, uh, much, more, much stronger at times than painting. Uh, I've been very influenced by great filmmakers. And I still think that I wish that I could have made films, because I think that is the medium which is uh, it has so much more. It has everything. It has sound and movement and uh, spectacle and uh, visual. It's it's everything. How do you so. think when you your work for the first time? Well, I'm scared. <laughs> but at that age, I was what 17, 18. One was overconfident. I'm much more scared now. When I the day that the show is opening, uh, much more nervous than I was on that day. I think I was overconfident at 18. Uh, I was cut down to size when I went to France, and I found that 
uh, this overconfident 18 year old who was much fated in India already at that early age was uh, considered a nobody and there were people far more talented uh, in France that I met among the other students and I found great gaps in my knowledge. Uh, so that was a very... Uh, actually, I had a big body of work already at 17 or 18, and uh, Hussein was the one who came and looked at all that work and said, come on, let's have an exhibition. So uh, it was just that. You had this uh, degree in English. Yes. You had an art degree. You are very attractive. Would you say an art degree? Would you play a country? No, 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 I don't. <laughs> no, no, neither. Not a Bengali. Yeah, all Bengali women are asked, you know, can you sing? And I said, no, I paint. <laughs> okay. No. Hmm. No, that uh, it happened almost simultaneously. In fact, I had my first exhibition in, uh, about three weeks before my BA finals. So I was doing it all along. I really wanted to do art. I didn't like uh, JJ, so that's why I went into English literature. That I've missed. I don't think I've missed anything really. I, I've had, it's amazing, lots of wishes fulfilled, and I've had many things that I never even wished for uh, that have happened to me, nice things. Uh, at this stage, I think with anybody who's my age, the main thing you wish for is good health so that you can continue to work. Because you know, the mind <coughs> remains young. It's, it's there's something funny that why the body decays uh, before the mind or spirit does. The spirit and mind, if you really, you realize that when you're older, that when you are 60, your mind is still that of a 17 or 16 year old. Uh, and that's how you perceive yourself. It's only when you look in the mirror and say, oh my God, <laughs> who's this? Uh, and the body seems to decay much faster than the mind. So one just prays for enough health to continue to work. W work is the most important thing. Mm. Yes. Oh, sometimes I use cameras. I prefer hardwood. Well, it, it uh, particularly suits this uh, technique that I've evolved of thin layers of translucent paint. Uh, and you get a wonderful texture uh, on, on the hard surface. I think this was because of uh, my early influence with icons, which is always painted on wood. Uh, it would be nice if one could paint on wood, but you can't get wood that size. But a lot of early Romanesque uh, and Christian art was painted on wood. It wasn't painted on canvas. Do you consider yourself as a feminist? I think uh, I don't consider myself as a feminist because our generation uh, just uh, missed feminism by a hair's breadth. And I'd already got on with my life uh, without uh, the effects of feminism uh, influencing my actions or uh, the way our attitudes. Uh, I support feminist aspirations, but I think that we have to evolve a new kind of feminism for India. For one thing, uh, amongst um, educated, the educated elite in India, unlike our sisters in uh, the West, uh, there's no element of uh, you know, domestic uh, drudgery. Because if you are earning uh, what I'd call an educated salary, you can certainly afford help still. And uh, so there's no need to stop your career. Or so all those uh, issues, I, I think, are, are unreal. And I, I don't have any uh, sympathy with women who opt out because they say, oh, you know, I've got married, I have to look after my children, uh, I've got to look after my in-laws. I think you can fit all that in because you still have help. You still have extended family to help you uh, in bringing up kids and so on. But I certainly think feminism uh, in, uh, in indigenized form is very, very necessary for uneducated women in this country who are perhaps the most exploited uh, creatures in the whole universe. The unexploited women of India, I mean the exploited women of India are the most, ex the, the really at the, at the bottom of the heap. 
To me, it's just my name. <laughs> it's just a name I've grown up with. Uh, yeah. Yes. Well, it was, um, uh, she didn't give me a... Uh, okay. Uh, Indira, Indira Gandhi, the portrait that I did of her just after she'd taken over as Prime Minister, and uh, somebody had commissioned me, I think it was the Staff College in Wellington, had commissioned me to do the portrait. So I asked her whether she'd give me sittings, and she said, look, I have no time to give you long sittings, but you can come everywhere with me for a week or 10 days, and that suits me fine, because I don't really sit, if I'm doing a portrait, I don't sit and actually do it uh, with sittings. I make mental notes and, and uh, notes on paper, and then make the portrait from memory. But uh, the portrait turned out, at that time she was very new and uh, she was, uh, the portrait turned out to have these very large, liquid, beautiful eyes and a very hard, uh, determined mouth. And I remember that Sanjay uh, hated the portrait and Rajiv loved it. So there was a bit, big debate in the family when it happened. But uh, it was fun doing it because she was, I think, that with people who she felt that she had nothing to lose or who weren't trying to get anything out of her, she was very relaxed. So I would be there for meals and I'd be with her in all her meetings. And I could see that she was a great listener. She would, all these different people would come uh, chugling about each other. The Akalis were there at that time. They were coming, different factions would come and she would just listen. And her mouth would set in a harder and harder line. And I had some early perception of that strength which then manifested itself much later on, uh, of that terrible strength that she had. Uh, so that did show in the portrait. Did you talk about the young artists? Did you have to talk about them? How the artists kind of uh, evolved from the long, long time? Well, the young artists today are very professional because they've been through a good schooling. Most of the art schools are spewing out maybe uh, 100, 200 artists every year, and there's so many art schools all over India. They have a much more professional approach uh, than we did uh, in our time, right from the very beginning. And uh, I think they're very ambitious. Some of them are what I'd call emotionally and mentally lazy. Uh, they're too eager to jump onto some winning formula. I find that's a trend which uh, is pretty bad. But there's a great deal of talent out there. Oh. A great, great deal of talent. Mm -hmm. That's another whole uh, very complex issue. And I think uh, nobody realizes that in order to make a mark in that whole global scene, there's got to be a huge injection of money. There has got to be a permanent presence for Indian art in places like New York, London, and Tokyo not these sporadic things where these festivals go once in a while, but a permanent presence which is on the gallery circuit, which people are seeing day after day. And almost every other country has that. You find galleries which are devoted to only to South American art or Chinese art or Russian art, but there's no such thing in India. I think now Bose Passia in New York is doing a great job. They have uh, a gallery more or less de devoted to Indian art. A uh, gallery was started in London, which then collapsed. Uh, because it just was not financially viable. It's all very, very expensive. To promote art there is very expensive. And there are all kinds of undercurrents and forces that none of us really understand. The other thing is that anyone who has to make it on the global scene has to, for instance, if you want to make it on the New York art scene, which is the hub of the global scene, you have to be resident. You can't be sitting in India and make it on the New York art scene. And this is true of almost every artist, including Hussein, uh, who have not really made it on the global scene because uh, those who have are resident, like Anish Kapoor is resident in England. And uh, I think Souza was well on his way to be recognized globally, but then his gallery packed up. Uh, and he was resident in America and London for so many years. Raza uh, is resident in Paris. So those artists have some following there. It is always a local following. You can't be sitting here and have a following globally. Uh, what about the exhibitions you did at 
Well, uh, exhibitions abroad, let's be very frank. All exhibitions, Indian exhibitions abroad, your main uh, buyers are certainly Indian still. They are the NRIs. It's not that we are making it globally. Uh, most of the buyers and most of the audiences are NRIs who have a natural interest in artists coming out from India.